sites and that's what we are going to discuss today so already from the american heart rhythm society there's a, a paper which has said it that it should be classified only in a certain way certain way is like the typical and a atypical so the typical is the counterclockwise okay so it's opposite so the typical is the one which goes against the clock okay and the reverse typical is called as clockwise so this is what is called as a three dimensional mapping which we all try to use trying to visualize the ecgs and then so this is how it will be looking for the counterclockwise counterclockwise is the typical atrial flutter so in that what happens is in this animation you can beautifully see so it is going is counterclockwise so that is against the clock so trying to make it again for you guys so we can see this is the superior vena cava right atrium inferior vena cava and the left atrium in fact and this is how it keeps on going and the counterclockwise is or the clockwise is it goes in the direction of clock so which is called as the reverse typical atrial flutter so so since now we are able to understand the re-entry circuit so what is happening let's try to understand the cardiac anatomy so what is literally happening is if we will look in this heart anatomy so there are various anatomy anatomical structures which is important for us to understand so this is called a superior vena cava this is the inferior vena cava and this structure is called as the coronary sinus so the coronary sinus is the one uh, which lies in the left atrioventricular groove in fact okay and this is what is the tricuspid valve okay and this is the eustachian ridge so what is and finally here comes the crista terminalis so what tends to happen is um, um, there is a zone of slow conduction which is called as the cavo tricuspid isthmus so that is the slow area where if you try to ablate and if you can do the blockage in that you will be able to not only terminate the atrial flutter you will also be able to stop its um, future recurrence as well so that is why even if you will be seeing on the intracardiac level some of those catheters are strategically put up in the different hello dr narendra yeah sorry to interrupt doctor this is navnita here uh, doctor uh, uh, your volume should be little bit more doctor your volume is very low okay uh, now is it better uh, doctor can you please if you are speaking in your mic can you please keep yes. your mic near and speak yeah the, i'm ke keeping it pretty close in fact uh, now yeah. how, how is it now it is okay doctor yes okay. doctor okay, well, i hope you are fine doctor yeah yeah thank you so much navnita okay. no problem doctor okay so um for the catheter positions which i was telling you in the heart you have to strategically keep those catheters so one catheter which is a quadripolar you try to keep it in the area of the his so it is not his or her so it is his his was the name of a scientist uh, after whom this anatomical structure has been named as his then there is a decapolar catheter which is kept into the coronary sinus okay and then a dual decapolar catheter which is kept in the right atrium okay so the reason is because you are trying to see for the activation is it anterior or lateral to the uh, this area in fact and then what happens is uh, you may also need to keep a quadripolar catheter at the rv apex and and yes if you so so these are this is how the different catheters are kept as i was telling you okay so this is the ablation catheter if you can see the arrows carefully this is the rv catheter and this is the one which you can keep in the coronary sinus and this is the rv catheter so you can try to keep it in the right atrium in fact so on the basis of that you will be trying to see where which uh, how is the propagation of the flutter in fact so yes a few people have their own um, modifications as well in the sense so they may try to use a little bit longer right atrium catheter which tends to extend even in the coronary sinus so that will be really long and it will be going and you try to do it okay so if you will try to see on a fluoroscopy or on the x-ray 
this is how it will look like you know the prox so this is the distal end which goes catheter like this the quadricular catheter will be going like this so these are the two different views left anterior oblique so the different catheters so there will be slight change in the orientation of the catheters and this is one will be the right ear RAO ob oblique in fact so one of the most important things which we all should be able to understand is how to recognize the catheters for example or this arrhythmia for example on the ECG isn't it it is very important for us that because not just doing the procedure uh, we should be able to understand what is literally happening over here so uh, if you want to really see on the ECG, you should be able to understand this. <coughs> <coughs> so some of the characteristics you will be able to associate it with is the rate, the P wave morphology, and also what about the changes which you will see on a 12 lead ECG in fact. So what will happen is, if you will see on the ECG, surface ECG, Especially if whenever you are in doubt, try to do a vagal maneuver or even you can administer an adenosine. So then those flutter waves which is going to be there, they will become more prominent, right? So this is what you are seeing over here. If you are given adenosine, so these flutter waves, they start becoming more prominent, okay? And then on the ECG, what is happening is in the counterclockwise uh, uh, typical flutter, the rate is very stable most of the times and it is pretty regular as well in the sense the atrial rhythm will be like 240 to 340 beats per minute and in fact so this is what is called as characteristically uh, called as sawtooth pattern in the sense in the counterclockwise you will be able to see negative deflection in the inferior leads okay but it will be positive in V1. So you can start imagining already. So V1 is positive, 2, 3 AVF is negative, the inferior is negative. So it is going counterclockwise, okay? And that is what is called as the typical flutter. Yeah? So, and then, and the ventricular rate most commonly, I would say, 2 is to 1 is the one uh, conduction which tends to happen. But yes, it can be sometimes 3 is to 1 as well. It can be even uh, different uh, uh, as well. So what I was talking is over here. So what is happening over here? If you look carefully in this ECG. So what we see is, there is a sawtooth pattern, right? However, in the ECG, oh, but so what is happening is, RR intervals is pretty same. And you also notice is what is called as the sawtooth pattern. So you should be able to identify or differentiate it with something is called as 3 to 1 AV block because it may look pretty similar but you will not be able to see what is called as the sawtooth pattern so that will be something very important so now coming to the typical atrial flutter in the typical atrial flutter what happens is as I was already telling you if you will be looking carefully in the lead V1 and the inferior leads you will be able to notice it and as I was telling you, so if you have placed your catheters in a strategic way, for example, you're trying to have a look, a pical look on the uh, right atrium. So you have already kept your right atrium catheters and the coronary sinuses there, over there, and then you try to look. So as I was telling you, the common type flutter, what is called as a typical flutter. Typical flutter is going against the clock, right? So this is how it will be the propagation right so, however the atypical flutter is of course different it is the clockwise flutter so if you have kept a 20 polar catheter in the heart so what is going to happen in the common type flutter the propagation is going to start from the 19 one, 1920 and it will keep on going 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 and then finally going up to one two right but it is going to be the opposite in the in the uncommon type okay so this is how you will be able to differentiate it so the cycle length is almost the same which you are able to see it over here however the propagation is of course different so over here what is happening is 
the CS activation is the earliest, which keeps on going to the 1920, and we can notice it over here, right? See, this is the beauty of ECGs, or especially EP, what do we see, is you are able to see everything, in fact, and it makes sense as well. So, on the ECGs, as I was telling you, you have to keep yeah. on focus, yeah? Excuse me, sir, sir yeah. your voice is very low, sir. Uh, how about others? Others are able to hear me well? And now how is the voice? Ah, uh, let me see audio. Ah, uh, ha, ha. see, I'm trying to... Okay, now is it better? Hello? built-in microphone I'm trying to okay I have I have made it the maximum now so how is it are you all able to hear now hello no. yeah yeah Tell me now better And now is it better? Yes, sir. Yes, it's better now. Okay, good, no, good. No. Okay. So there was a system setting, the Cisco WebEx, what we are using, the it was set up on a lower volume. So okay, yeah. anyways. Okay. So as I was telling you, if you will focus on the V1 and the inferior leads, so you will be able to notice the morphology. And of course, the type of flutter as well, which we are having. Similarly, if you are having those intracardiac ECGs as well, so if you keep a catheter in the right atrium, you will be able to see, for example, what is happening in this um, arrhythmia. So CS distal is the earliest. And then after that, it goes to 3, 4, 5, 6, and then slowly keeps expanding and up to 1920. Okay, and this continues even for the his as well. So, can you make a guess how is the propagation? So, for example, the duo deca catheter, the propagation is happening from the distal to the proximal. Okay, so if the propagation is happening from the distal to the proximal end, so this is reverse typical so what happens is uh, so uh, the basic concept what we should be having is we need to be having the understanding of the conduction barriers and about the diagnosis for example for the mapping and treatment and pacing maneuvers and similarly we should be able to prove the diagnosis first okay and then after not just after proving that we should be able to uh, confirm which area shall we be targeting and then we do it so what is happening is uh, it is important for us to be able to induce the arrhythmia as well so how do we induce the arrhythmia so especially if it is atrial flutter you can try to use extra stimulus pacing atrial burst pacing or even you can use isoprotonol but always remember in fact 25 percent of the patients who are ha only having atrial flutter will develop atrial fibrillation Okay, similarly, up to 20-25% of those atrial fibrillation patients, even if you ablate them, they may need is a uh, flutter line as well. So, for example, in this patient as well, what is happening is, uh, but don't try to use too much of, uh, you know, a burst pacing. Because as I said, it, they may develop atrial fibrillation as well. So, what is happening is, so conduction will be happening. But as I was telling you, there will be a small area of slow conduction where you can make the ablation line and ablate it. And how, so the question comes is, how do you identify that? Okay, that which area you are going to target. So, so for example, whenever you are targeting those areas as well, uh, we, need, we need to have in our mind, what is those areas of slow conduction? I'm going to sh show you in the 
different areas. So this is how it will be looking like if you are in the heart. So you can note the position of the duodecal polar catheter in relation to the tricuspid valve annulus. And what is happening is, in the typical atrial flutter circuit tends to involve the following structures and follows this general counterclockwise path. So across the roof of the right atrium, from medial to lateral, down the lateral right free wall in front of the crystal terminalis, which is superior to inferior. Similarly, across the isthmus between the tricuspid valve annulus and the inferior vena cava, lateral to medial, and up above the septum, which is inferior to superior. So on an overall basis, the left atrium activates incidentally from a low septal to the left upper pulmonary vein direction at the same time as the right atrial septal activation happens. So if you look at the sequential activation around the right atrium, so you can see it clearly, right? So how is it going in which direction? So this is what is happening in the reverse typical atrial flutter, which I already said it is clockwise flutter. So, and it tends to involve the structures, but in the opposite direction. So you can already notice the sequential activation around the right atrium in this. So what is happening over here? So we all are interested in the ECG, right? So what is actually the mechanism of double potential? So what happens is uh, most of the researchers, they already support the idea of block. It may be functional or even fixed in the right atrium along the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava line, or some point to the cava tricuspid, others to the sinus, uh, sinus venosus region. In fact, it is important to point out that without line of block, the re-entry will be short-circuited, in fact. So the poor transverse conduction properties of the CTI may result in double potentials. So the, again, uh, the differential diagnosis, if you come across an arrhythmia, how are you going to differentiate? So as I had already said it, atrial flutter has a very characteristic rate. Uh, so and uh, so even on these parameters as well, we'll try to differentiate about the commonly uh, similar arrhythmias. So in this, what is happening is, you may be able to notice what is called as focal atrial tachycardia. However, focal atrial tachycardia is pretty fast, much more faster compared to the flutter. So you will be able to notice few phenomena, what is called as warm-up phenomenon, cool-down phenomenon, and even when someone exercises, there will be increase in the rate for this. So let me try to explain to you with this beautiful animation. So as you can see, when you are pacing, so this is how the propagation is going to go around. So are you able to notice it well? Okay, so let me try to show you again. So when you are pacing, okay, over here, so this is how the re-entry circuit is going to happen. So this is what is called as the phenomenon of entrainment. So in the sense, if the post-pacing interval is equivalent to the tachycardia cycle, so you are in part of the cell, okay? Otherwise, the other phenomenon, what can happen is post-pacing interval is more than the tachycardia cycle length. Okay, let's try to show you with an example. So what is happening over here? So the TA, uh, so this is the duodecapolar catheter, 20 pole electrode catheter. So the 1, 2 catheter is available at the low anterolateral right atrium, okay, at like 7.30 position. So when you are pacing from the 7 o'clock at 200 millisecond cycle length, it results in entrainment. So what do we see in the first three weeks? So the morphology at the recording site during the pacing capture, which is the transient entrainment and during the spontaneous atrial flutter is unchanged, indicating that activation of this site occurs the same way during the pacing as it does during spontaneous atrial flutter. So for the entrainment mapping, what is happening is, uh, it is very important that where are we pacing actually? If we are in the circuit, we'll be able to entrain it and the tachycardia cycle or the post-pacing interval is going to be equivalent or 
the difference will be less than 30 in fact. However, of course, if you are far away, it will not be much. So, we already said about the right atrial flutter. So, there is also something is called as the left atrial flutter as well. So, left atrial flutter is important in the sense because a lot of times when someone has already been ablated for the atrial fibrillation, uh, whenever a lot of, most commonly, okay, this is the trick I would share with you all. Mitral flutter, uh, so what is called as a left atrial flutter is rare in a virgin heart. So if it is a virgin heart, most commonly try to think for a uh, right sided flutter. However, if you have already ablated for the atrial fibrillation and all, most commonly try to think for the left atrial flutter. Okay. So what is happening is, in the left atrial flutter, the activation sequence in the left atrial flutter it will be from the left to the right in the coronary sinus or from the mid coronary sinus in both directions. Okay. So as I was telling you, from the left to the right in the coronary sinus, okay, otherwise from the mid coronary sinus to the both the directions. So there is no actually standard approach how to map the left atrial flutter. And yes, you are trying to do is the, again, same thing, you're trying to connect the anatomical barriers. The anatomical barriers over here will be the mitral annulus to the pulmonary vein. So even in this as well, um, um, yeah, I remember, so one of the things which I had learned at Hamburg from uh, Professor Fifan, Dr. Fifan, he's one of the really genius, uh, he was there for a pretty long time. So other than this as well, you can even try to sometimes connect, if because a lot of times if you're trying to ablate it endocardially, it may be really difficult. So what you do is, you try to go to the right superior pulmonary vein and you can try to draw a line even to the mitral line, uh, to mitral as well, because... That is more of a, uh, it is easier to put it up and uh, uh, because the mitral line as I was studying, telling you the endocardial one may be very short but it can be very difficult to achieve endocardially always. So sometimes you may also have to go inside the coronary sinus and give some burns and for the verification for that what you do is you put up a, your uh, halocatheter. Uh, in the left atrial appendage and when you try to pace from there in the coronary sinus the pattern of activation is going to change so this is how you notice for that so okay uh, <laughs> uh, these were the extra bonus points for this lecture so uh, now coming back to our topic so what we notice is double potentials so double potentials as I already said it, they are more of indicative of a line of block so line of block so what is happening is because there's Christa terminalis, which is an important anatomical and functional barrier in the atrial flutter, okay? And it can, of course, be fixed or uh, functional block. So then that is the reason uh, uh, you try to consider eustachian ridge, otherwise the atriotomy sites, as examples of fixed line of block. So there is evidence which shows that the block in the region of Christa terminalis during atrial flutter is more of a form of functional conduction block okay so that is why double potentials may also be recorded from sites of local block outside the re-entrant circuit in fact the interpretation of double potential should always be relative to the activation sequence and also the response of uh, these potentials to the pacing maneuvers okay so what do we notice in this? So what is happening is already one arrhythmia is going on over here. However, uh, if you will be looking carefully at the way is our ablation catheter. So in the ablation catheter, you will be noticing over here. So in this ECG, what do we notice over here is that, see, when a simple conduction is happening, okay, so if something is coming towards an electrode, it will be positive deflection. And if it is going to go away from this, it will be more of negative deflection. So what is happening in this other one, if there is a block, so what do we notice over here? That is where the double potentials are going to come. Because these ECGs, they are going, so there will be those barriers of conduction. So that is why it, it is, the conduction is going to happen like this and finally double potentials are seen. So what is happening is, 
as I already said it, the conduction velocity is determined by the direction, okay, and the conduction along the long axis. So the longitudinal of a muscle fiber is rapid. However, the conduction perpendicular to the long axis is slow. So we all are interested like how to take care of these patients and all if they come to us and all. So how are we going to treat? So there are medical therapies which is available. You can give them excellent uh, drugs like diltiazem or even um, drawn as well. You can give or propofenone is also pretty good in fact. Or of course the best thing is if you can ablate them, you are going to treat them for life. So coming to the medications, so what is happening is they, sh they can be uh, attempted to convert, okay? And uh, otherwise, yeah, if someone is really getting compromised on the hemodynamic parameters, you should try to even cardioward them. Don't be afraid for that. Uh, but one of the important things about its management is that thromboembolic risk is really well defined. There is more and more evidence which is coming up is anticoagulation should be given in fact for such kind of patients so even such patients can be tried for overdrive pacing so if you have a facility for putting up a, a temporary lead and all or of course if you can take it to the uh, ep lab as well you can do a overdrive pacing and especially if someone has already uh, is happening the flutter especially secondary to the cabg you can do it uh, there is a traditional thinking as well in which they try to do is like AV nodal ablation. So in AV nodal ablation because um, you must be able to ablate the node and implant a pacemaker as well. But it is not advocated uh, nowadays. Uh, so RF ablation of uh, this should be the preferred strategy. So because our goal is not just to you know, the elimination of the conduction between the critical zone of the reiterate circuit, which is necessary to sustain the atrial flutter, but also terminate and prevent future recurrence. So what happens is, the initial RF catheter should be placed well on the ventricular aspect of the, of the tricuspid valve annulus to ensure there is a contiguous line from the tricuspid valve annulus to the inferior vena cava and placing the catheter so that a large ventricular ECG and a small or no atrial ECG is present ensures that the starting point of asthmus ablation leaves no inadvertent gap. In fact, the loss of atrial ECG to the proximal ablation recording during RF confirms that the catheter has fallen to the inferior vena cava. So as I said it initially, big V, small A, and keep on going, uh, dragging down, and uh, till the time almost no A is seen. But you should be understanding that uh, you must give a higher power ablation because of the blood pooling. And uh, yes, uh, whenever you are there in the inferior vena cava, the patient may be really, really symptomatic as well. So what happens is. All the strategies for elimination of conduction through the isthmus must be confirmed post ablation with a programmed stimulation and or mapping. In fact, termination of tachycardia during ablation in or itself is not indicative of block in the isthmus. And care must be taken not to confuse conduction delay with isthmus block. In fact, the strategies for radio frequency ablation include ablation during sinus rhythm, when atrial flutter cannot be induced with provocative measures, but evidence of asthmus conduction has been confirmed or is suspected. Okay, so termination during atrial flutter with RF ablation may include observation of increasing delay in conduction time within the asthmus with concomitant increase in atrial flutter cycle length. So as I was already telling you about the methods, you can try to drag, otherwise point by point ablation. You can also do, do it during tachycardia itself or during sinus rhythm as well. But in the sinus rhythm, what, and then in the end, you can try to do coronary sinus pacing. So you will be able to notice the 
shift in activation. But yes, when you are ablating during the tachycardia, so what is happening is you may be able to notice the tachycardia will stop. So how are you going to orient whenever you are doing the ablation procedure? So one can do it during the RAO or LAO projection. And then the LAO projection tends to allow the identification of position in the clock face relative to the tricuspid valve annulus, so which is point to point. Similarly, the RAO, LAO projection tends to allow visualization of the RF catheter, okay, as it is seen in the, uh, the real orientation over here, so which I was telling you. In fact, using the RAO projection, you can discriminate the anterior tricuspid valve initial position to the inferior final position, which is uh, uh, during the creation of lesions in the isthmus, okay? So, this orientation is very important. Uh, but yes, if someone is really uh, bothered about the radiations and all, RAO is definitely much more better compared to the LAO. And uh, so these are the different ablation sites which is available. So if we look carefully at the coronary sinus position to the inferior vena cava, so the coronary sinus is almost nearly at the like 430 position and the inferior vena cava, <coughs> you can try to draw a line at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. However, so if you are trying to draw a line at the 430 position, which will be more of a septal asthmus, so the distance is very short. However, you may be able to come across a lot of valleys, okay. However, on the opposite side, yes, the distance may be longer, but it tends to be more smooth. So this is the reason, so since the, as we can already see, so this is how we can beautifully see how the catheter goes inside the heart, okay. So it is, uh, let it be clockwise or anti-clockwise, so what is happening is, you are seeing the, the isthmus is going to be almost in the same area. And yes, the septal isthmus block, as I was already telling you, so you try to make it from the tricuspid annulus to the base of the CS os. And if the leak occurs between the coronary sinus os and this eustachian ridge, the line is further extended to the ER. So, so we can already see it over here, which I was telling you about those lesion lines so how do we put it okay so these are those different anatomical areas which is there like the svc ivc over here okay and the lines which we try to put it up but the there are of course there are some challenges as well challenges in the sense there will be pooling of the blood and especially the posterior asthmus is non-uniform and there will be eustachian valve and the ridge as well, which can make it further difficult to show you. So, for example, we can see it clearly over here, right? So, this is more of the septal isthmus and this is the posterior isthmus over here you're trying to do. So, as I was telling you about those non-uniform surface. So, from outside it looks very easy and good, but when you try to go inside the hard surface, you notice, hmm, it's not so easy. So as I was telling you about the different views, so this is the RAO view and this is the LAO view. Okay, so this is the ablation catheter. So, and you can notice there's a quadripolar RV catheter and this is the decapolar CS catheter, duodecapolar RA catheter, which has been kept. So you can try to use it according to the views which you are more comfortable of. So, so what happens is once the atrial flutter induction and pacing has been completed to determine the activation pre-ablation, you know, we are ready to ablate the AF, okay? So, the doctors will do is like either ablate the septal or the posterior asthmus. In fact, in the case above, the posterior asthmus is being ablated over here, okay? The catheter is placed in the LAO view between the 6 a.m. and the 7 o'clock position, between the 6 and 7 o'clock position on the tricuspid annulus to obtain a A-wave to V-wave ratio of 1 is to 2. 
So the signals ratio is very important. And in fact, this is the one which was going to show the catheter is in the annulus. And then radio frequency catheter current is applied. And the catheter is pulled back a few millimeters towards the inferior vena cava every 20 to 30 seconds. And you are observing in the RAO view. And it is important to be sure the lip of inferior vena cava where the atrium attaches is ablated and may require sometimes a smaller curve as well to do so. So I'll try to give you a little bit of anatomical picture as well. How does it look like? And that is why a lot of times you now when you are, especially if you will be falling into the inferior vena cava now, so there is a sudden fall. So when, when, when you are trying to drag the catheter, you will just boop, it will, the catheter is going to come out. So again, you will be you are able to see beautifully how the catheters are kept, especially in the septal position, septal isthmus, in fact. So this is the posterior isthmus line. Okay, so rather than the septal, it is more longer. You are a little bit, uh, but yes, it it tends to be more smoother, in fact. So it is a little bit uh, easier, but uh, long. It takes longer time to uh, get the block. So in fact, the second location is for making a block line is the posterior isthmus, which I said it. And the block line is made by ablating the, uh, between the areas of the tricuspid annulus and the inferior vena cava. And this is a bit longer than the septal isthmus, but still widely used. Sometimes, if we are unsuccessful with the posterior isthmus, yes, some of the physicians will extend that line to the ER. And also, other doctor may be able to ablate both the septal and posterior isthmus. There are some uh, rare occasions when we tend to create a block line but may not be successful because of the leakage uh, which may be happening under the crista terminalis or between the crista terminalis and the inferior vena cava. And if this occurs, no matter how long we are trying to make a, a block, of course, we are going to be unsuccessful. Unless and until we make a new line between the inferior vena cava and the uh, crystal terminalis. And in order to determine whether or not this leak is under the crystal terminalis is occurring, you know, before the ablation, so we should be able to keep a basket catheter or a spiral, you know, uh, catheter in the inferior vena cava to be able to map if the leak is occurring. And the thing is, why am I stressing on this is because by doing so, we will be avoiding a lot of unnecessary time and unnecessary x-ray exposure as well, which can be avoided. And yes, you will be able to treat them with the ablation, in fact. So as I already showed you about the fluoroscopic orientations, so yes, both object, uh, projections are, of course, pretty useful and helpful in confirming and identifying the location during RF ablation, okay, and the CS is, is present at the 5 o'clock position. So I'll try to, so this is, for example, in the LAO view. So in the LAO view, you will be able to define these, both the valves. So this is the mitral valve, which you can see. So because you, tr you are trying to define its anatomy using the coronary sinus catheter, which is over there. Then comes the tricuspid annulus. So in the tricuspid annulus, you have kept your right atrium catheters. And this is the ablation catheter. So I'm trying to show you more and more diagrams because visual memory is a little bit more stronger and it goes into our brain easily, in fact. So sometimes we may, we may attempt the ablation during the tachycardia. But once the tachycardia is terminated, the catheter may... Uh, dislodge in fact requiring the termination of the RF and therefore it has become a common practice to perform the ablation during sinus rhythm however in general termination of AF would indicate success if unsuccessful it will be necessary to go back over the block line to find and ablate the leaks and uh, one sign uh, that the tissue was ablated is if the electrograms recorded from the distal ele electrode pair on the ablation catheter decreases in amplitude, so it shows tissue death. For this, a generator with a special filter to filter out the RF noises 
necessary. And once the ablation is complete, the block line will be confirmed by pacing from the CS. And so one you can pace from the septal side, one from the lateral side. The septal side will be from the CS, and the lateral side is going to be from the lower lateral right atrium. Okay. So once you have done already uh, given all your sweat and everything in the cath lab, so what are you going to do? So you are trying to find out the end point. So what is the ablation end point? So the ablation end point will be termination of the clinical arrhythmia. Otherwise, if you are unable to reinduce the atrial flutter. Otherwise, of course, if you can prove the bidirectional block, so by noticing between the pre and post timing and also the block indicated by the multipolar catheters. So how do they look like? So for example, this is a typical aerial flutter which is going on and then during the RF application it tends to stop. Tachycardia stops. So this is another example as well. So the same thing is happening. RF application was being done and then you notice over here uh, that uh, it changes. So sometimes if already patient is having sinusism, so what do you do is you will start doing the coronary sinus pacing. So in the coronary sinus pacing, you will be able to see different patterns of activation. So if you are doing it before ablation and after ablation. So before ablation, what happens is the activation sequence of the CS, of course, we can see in those uh, duodeca polar catheters. So what happens is the conduction tends to exit in two activation fronts. One traveling up the septum and the other across the isthmus and up the free wall. And these should occur simultaneously. Eventually, those two wave fronts will collide with each other and somewhere on the free wall and stop. So what is happening is thus, uh, as we can see in this diagram clearly, the activation is going to look like this. And we may repeat the same procedure, for example, from the lower right atrium, which is the lower right lateral, which is close to the tricuspid annulus 5-6. And in this case, the activation sequence should be the opposite of uh, above with TA 5-6, the earliest, and spreading out in two simultaneous wave fronts towards the TA-12 and TA 1920. The two wave fronts will eventually collide on the septum and stop. The doctor uses this to prove the activation traveling through the isthmus so that post ablation he can prove the activation does not cross the isthmus and in fact is blocked. So, in the pre-ablation, what is happening over here? The coronal sinus CS spacing is happening. And we are able to note that the conduction trends to travel in two main wave fronts. One travels from the CS through the isthmus to the lateral wall and the other up the septum through the appendage to the lateral wall, activating the smooth atrium as it goes. And both the wave fronts collide with each other on the free wall. In fact, if you will notice carefully during the pacing, the conduction cannot transverse the crista terminalis or eustachian ridge. Thus, these act as the barrier to the reentrant circuit. So now what is happening over here is, in the sinus rhythm, when you are trying to pace from the CS. So uh, right atrium pacing is being done over here. So one of the really important things which we all should be able to understand what is called as a bidirectional block. So bidirectional, you have so the block should be there from both the sides, from the lateral side, from the septal side as well. Okay. So this is what is happening. So you are trying to show for the isthmus block. So in this, what you are doing is you are pacing from the coronary sinus. Okay. And then there is a block. So that is the reason. So the activation is happening in a one special way. If we can look at over here. So to make the difference more easier. So earlier the activation was happening like this. But once the block has happened. So the 
the pattern of activation tends to change, right? Which I had already explained to you. So now, if the isthmus block has already happened, if you are trying to see from the right atrium pacing, so this is how it will be is going to affect the pacing, okay? So when you are pacing from the CS during the ablation with the isthmus block, you will start noticing the double potentials is already of course there as well, okay? And the of course, so what is happening is uh, over here when you are trying to do a left atrium pacing, lower left side after ablation. So what is happening over here is this is not a good line. Okay, so I'll try to give you a diagrammatic summary. How do they look like? So in the sense, this is very important. So if you have kept a coronary sinus catheter, this is the you know right atrium do or decouple a catheter, and this is the crystal terminalis. So before ablation, when you pace from the coronary sinus, so the activation is going to converge like this. And why am I talking like this? I'm trying to explain it to you. In the coronary sinus, you will be no, uh, able, uh, so whenever you are pacing from the coronary sinus, so you are going to able to notice like this. Because the activation is going to happen from both the sides. Okay. But after the ablation, since there is now a CTI line, so one side is blocked. So the activation is going to happen from only from 1920 to 12. Okay. However, if you are trying to look in the duo decapolar catheters, in the duo decapolar catheter, if you are pacing from the lower left right atrium, so if you are pacing from there, so one activation front is going to go from here, you know, up to like 16, 17, and the other front is going to go from the opposite side. So that is why you are going to see a segment like this. However, post ablation, this is going to be all straight line. Always remember it like this. So there will be a more of an oblique line, you know, after ablation. So because of the CTI block. So one of the important uh, concept is like um, trying to understand like what are the other ways? So yeah, there are other ways which I already said it like vector mapping is called as there. You can search for the gaps in the block line and you can also do the differential pacing. So vector mapping, what how you do is you try to take a, you know, uh, so th this is a, like a little bit of special catheter. You try to move it around. So this is a little bit longer catheter. So which you can keep it even in the right atrium and also in the coronary sinus as well. So this is like a single catheter. So for this what you do is you try to push a little bit in, push up, take out a little bit. So there will be changes in the ECGs. Okay and then what do you notice is if it is going to be incomplete you are not going to be uh, you know that uh, your whatever double potentials will be there of course in the ablation catheter they are not going to be uh, so long and in fact what is going to happen is, if you are going to look carefully, there will be change in the pattern. So pattern will be like, in the sense, either it is going to be positive, both of them, uh, the, the terminal signals which you see, either it is positive or positive to negative, but not negative negative. So if, whenever you are trying to move around and you see negative both the potentials, that is the time you can understand it is you have achieved a block okay and of course uh, uh, the longer uh, the uh, the double potentials are also going to be spaced longer so what is happening over here so I will try to explain you a little bit um, a bird's eye view uh, so what is happening is when you are pacing on one side of the block line you will be able to note double potentials along the line where you have made a complete line however where there is a gap as you slowly move the catheter you will note that the double potential disappear that you are on a gap you might also find some fractionated potentials and you can look for the sites with large electrograms meaning they have not been ablated and ablate on those sites do you understand so this is how you try to look for the search for the gaps so you will try to go a little bit proximally distally 
So this was an important concept which was proposed by Tada, Tada et al. So who reported that the interval separating the two components of the double potential was useful to distinguish the complete, which is more than 110 milliseconds, from incomplete isthmus block, which is less than 90 milliseconds. In the patients, in the patients uh, undergoing the radio frequency ablation for the typical atrial flutter, okay, and therefore we applied the measurement of the in all the morphologies, including the double potentials. So I'll try to show you again a beautiful animation. So what is happening over here is, so this is how you're trying to confirm the block line. Okay, so the in the uh, pre-ablation, of course, there is no block line. So that is why, if you will be able to notice the 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 diff the double potentials are going to be separated only 90 milliseconds. However, once you have ablated it well, it is going to take longer. Okay, so that is why it will be more than 110 milliseconds. See, so now once the block has already happened over here, see. Okay, I hope you were able to understand. So I'll try to give, do it again. Okay, see, now what is happening over here? So what is happening over here is the interval separating the two components of a double potential was used to distinguish, you know, the complete versus the incomplete. So what is happening is, as I was already telling you, so how does it happen? So before ablation, you are trying to pace it. So this is how the it is going to go through the lower left lateral. Uh, and for example, from the other side, this is how it is going to go. However, once there is a block line, of course, beyond this, it will not be able to go, right? Similarly, from the uh, the other side as well. So that is why you will be able to notice. So I hope now with this understanding, you will be having a very clear understanding of this. So as I was telling you, so there is higher risk of thromboembolic phenomenon for those patients who are having associated diabetes, hypertension, or even atrial enlargement. So that is the reason they all should be treated with anticoagulants. Anticoagulants, we all have already had a lot of sessions which we all can f uh, focus upon. In fact, uh, the newer evidence is already there like this that you must anticoagulate them. There is no doubt about it actually. Give them anticoagulation, okay? So, after understanding so uh, about the pathology, we have already spoken that, yes, cavotrichospid is must Isthmus block is very, very important for such kind of patients, okay? And uh, uh, you should, after confirming your diagnosis, you should try to do a entrainment, try to localize, is it really cavotrichospid isthmus dependent? And once, yes, you are very sure, that is the time you can try to use the LAO, RO, whichever you are comfortable, and you can try to manage. And I already sh said to you about the relationship compared to the atrial fibrillation that yes both of them are very much interrelated if one is there the other one is going to follow very soon that's for sure okay